Okay, welcome to module four. This is pretty much an evolution of everything that you were doing yesterday, both in terms of the theoretical material and the practical tutorial materials. We're basically just going to continue on uh, with the tutorial from where we left off. Uh, and it seems like most or all of you have got through uh, day one tutorial, at least the, the Linux part of it, quite successfully. Uh, so hopefully that will go smoothly. Uh, what we're really going to talk about now is more of the isoform discovery and alternative expression uh, analysis, and there are some components of cufflinks and cuffdiff uh, that help us uh, to perform this kind of analysis. Uh, so this is where we are in tutorial uh, module four. Uh, basically, the main learning objective of this module is to uh, reuse cufflinks in a, a few different modes. Uh, so cufflinks have this, has this reference annotation based transcript assembly mode uh, where it's going to use um, a GTF file representing the transcriptome to assemble uh, what it thinks the transcriptome looks like in your sample, but using some notion of the known transcriptome as a guide. Uh, and then there's sort of a fully de novo mode where it doesn't know anything about the transcriptome. You might not even have a GTF file for your species, uh, and it's going to try to assemble the transcriptome basically from scratch. So uh, this could allow you to basically create uh, the first uh, notion of a transcriptome for a species that perhaps hasn't had its transcripts annotated yet. But both of these do require a reference genome sequence. So we're using reference in, in two different contexts. There's the, the reference genome assembly that we align our reads to, uh, and then there's reference annotations uh, of transcripts that have been annotated on that uh, reference genome. Uh, and whenever we're using cufflinks, uh, cuffdiff, et cetera, we always need the, the reference genome, but we, we don't necessarily need the, the reference transcript annotations. We can use them if we want to, but we don't have to use them. Does that mean that neither of these um, no, I wouldn't say that um, because we haven't discovered every gene in human yet, and we haven't discovered every isoform of every gene in human in particular. So most we know that most human genes have many isoforms, uh, but a lot of them have not been well characterized or discovered yet. So we're going to see how, basically, if you look at any RNA-seq data, you can find evidence for isoforms that are not currently annotated at Ensemble pretty quickly. I think that our, our view of the human transcriptome is far from complete. Um, and that's because it's a very complex, large problem. Uh, so just to re review this gene exp expression plot so, uh, diagram, so I showed this the first day. Uh, really what we're going to start talking about in more detail is this part here uh, where we have splicing machinery that comes along uh, and converts a pre-mRNA immature uh, RNA molecule into a mature RNA by removing the introns and splicing the exons together. Uh, so what's depicted here uh, is this happening in one way. So we have three exons being defined in a particular way. The introns between them are being removed and we get a single messenger RNA. Uh, and there's a very, very complex machinery that, can, that regulates this and controls this process, and there are many regulatory features that are recognized. Uh, and generally, if, as I said, for most human genes, you don't actually just get one form. Uh, you get multiple forms. So exon 2 might be skipped, uh, and various other things about it may, may differ. For, uh, and often, you'll get m multiple isoforms being generated from the same locus uh, in the same tissue. Uh, <coughs> And there's a whole field of biology studying the, the effects of uh, alternative splicing and the functional consequences of alternative isoforms. As far as RNA-seq goes, there's also a whole field of bioinformaticians and mathematicians and statisticians and analysts uh, studying ways to take RNA-seq data and try to learn something about alternative splicing. Uh, so you don't need to worry about reading this, but I provide it as a, as a reference. Um, it comes from uh, a blog, the RNA-seq blog, which is a really uh, useful blog for keeping on top of RNA-seq developments. There's a guy in Spain that uh, it has a real interest in RNA-seq and he regularly posts uh, interesting papers that come out, tools that are developed and so on. Uh, and he's working, has recently submitted the paper that has this figure. I think it still hasn't been published, but uh, it's been made available. 
that's basically sort of an ongoing map of different tools that you can use uh, to study alternative splicing from RNA-seq data and they're sort of broken down by categories. There's tools that help you with the mapping, uh, tools that help you uh, reconstruct isoforms from uh, your uh, alignment files, uh, tools that help you quantify those transcripts once you've identified what their structures are, uh, and then tools that help you compare uh, the expression of those transcripts between conditions. Uh, and as you can see, there are many, many tools, and we're just going to use a, a small number of them. I've also provided here uh, a list of useful resources uh, and discussions uh, that have uh, started to accumulate on Biostars. Uh, so, for example, there's some, been some discussion of what the best approaches are to predict novel and alternative splicing events from RNA-seq data, and there's a couple uh, forum posts there to help you uh, get going on that topic. Uh, alternative splicing detection, same thing. Uh, identifying genes that express different isoforms in cancer versus normal specifically. Uh, and then some questions about the, the cufflinks, cuff-diff out uh, in particular. Uh, and then a, a, a post that tries to summarize some of the ways that we can visualize alternative splicing events using RNA-seq data. So I'm just going to spend a few slides here reviewing the types of alternative expression. So it's a good to, or alternative splicing, I'm going to use those terms somewhat interchangeably. Uh, it's good to think about what the structures are that we're trying to predict here. So again, I'm showing sort of a cartoon model uh, of a gene with three exons uh, and two introns. Uh, and in the simplest case, it's going to be transcribed and result in our uh, simple isoform with exons one, two, and three, and then it gets polyadenylated. Uh, it's, sometimes there'll be sort of a most common isoform that will be called the canonical isoform. Uh, and then there would often be a variety of alternative isoforms, uh, and these can be generated by different mechanisms. Uh, so you can have alternative transcript initiation, where the polymerase starts transcribing the RNA at, say, this position or that position, and depending on which position is used, you'll get an exon that includes exon 1 or starts at exon 2. Uh, so basically, in this case, you've got transcripts that have different 5' prime ends, uh, and this may or may not affect the, the protein sequence. Uh, alternative splicing uh, deals with the things sort of in the middle of the transcript rather than the beginning or the end. Uh, so, for example, in uh, cassette exon skipping, you have the simple scenario where uh, exon 2 might be included uh, or it might be skipped. Uh, and again, you can have a combination of these two events uh, happening at the same time in the same tissue, or perhaps this one is brain specific and this one is liver specific. Uh, all kinds of scenarios can occur. Uh, in addition to the whole exon being skipped, you can have alt uh, alternative boundaries of each exon. So what's being shown here is an alternative uh, three prime boundary uh, or a donor site. So that this exon has two donor sites that can be used. And uh, depending on which one is used, you'll get slightly different uh, mRNA sequences. And then you can have the same thing uh, at the acceptor site uh, or the five prime end of the exon where uh, you can get alternate uh, five prime sites being used, and again, these give you slightly different uh, exons. And this difference can be very small, it can be just a few bases, or it can be quite large. Uh, it might have a, a, a very pronounced effect on the protein sequence, or it might have a very subtle effect. Uh, it can result in uh, a nonsense uh, signal being introduced, and then one of these might be degraded by nonsense mediated decay. Uh, in this scenario, you have exon skipping, uh, as I showed on the last slide, but in this case, you've got mutually exclusive exons. This is a relatively rare but interesting pattern that's seen in some human genes where uh, exon 1 and 3 will always be included, uh, and then one of two uh, alternate exon 2s will be included. So you wind up with transcripts that have uh, basically the middle of them is different. Uh, the entire intron could be ret retained. So uh, in this example, you've got exon 1, and then instead of, instead of having exon 2 and 3, effectively you just have one large exon 2 uh, that gives you a, a much larger transcript. Uh, and these intron retentions will, will commonly uh, introduce a stop codon uh, and trigger nonsense mediated decay. So they can uh, effectively be a way of silencing a gene uh, without actually stopping transcribing it. Uh, finally, so we talked about alternative transcript initiation that gives you different five prime ends of transcripts. You can have the same thing at the three prime end uh, where uh, poly alternate polyadenylation signals are used uh, and it gives you transcripts that differ in the exons at the, the three prime end.
So when we're thinking about analyzing RNA-seq data to find these kinds of events, it's useful to think about uh, what these patterns are and whether our analysis, analysis strategy will be able to tell us something about each of these categories or whether it might be limited to particular uh, categories. And as you look at these diagrams, you can start to think about uh, what the sequences are that will help you distinguish what's going on. So really you have uh, two things going on. You have the, the sequence content uh, of the exons that's included. So one can imagine searching for uh, this sequence and this sequence to try to get an idea wh which of these two things is being expressed. Uh, and the other form of information that we have is the connections between exons. So you have distinct paths through the genome and we can look at look for the sequences in our RNA-seq data that are distinctive of those unique paths through uh, the genome. So these are the, the splicing events that join two exons together, uh, and that join is often called an exon-exon junction. Uh, so we're going to be looking at uh, the junctions.bed file from Top Hat, for example, which is basically a readout of this information from your RNA-seq data. Uh, and you can use it to reconstruct, in theory, a lot of these kinds of patterns, uh, or at least infer uh, what might be going on. So this is just sort of a bit of a, a, a history lesson on sequencing methods for studying alternative isoforms, which is going to culminate with Illumina sequencing. Uh, so again, showing just an example region of the genome uh, with a variety of hypothetical transcript variants that differ in their 5 prime ends, uh, in their 3 prime ends, uh, the exons that they include or skip uh, the boundaries of those exons that are used, uh, introns being retained, and so forth. Uh, and really, the sort of gold standard for resolving the structure uh, of transcripts is full-length cDNA sequencing. Uh, if we could just sequence cDNAs from end to end without having to break them in pieces, and we could do thousands or hundreds of thousands or even better millions of those things, we would not bother with the, all, any of the analysis that we're doing today. Uh, because we would not have to do nearly as much inference. If we could just, for example, with uh, nanopore sequencing, feed a transcript through a pore and read its, se its sequence in entirety from one end to, to the other, we wouldn't need to do any fancy analysis. We would know pretty, pretty well what the structure looked like. Uh, but unfortunately, there's just no way to do this in a really high throughput fashion. Uh, there have been some large scale pro projects that attempt to capture some representation of a huge number of human cDNAs, but they're done at great expense by large genome centers over the period of decades. Uh, for example, the, the EST sequencing projects, you know, spent millions and millions of dollars and took many, many years to generate these huge databases of, of transcript structures, but it's just not a very high throughput technology. So there's been some various attempts to do this in a much more high throughput way. So there's various uh, small tag-based approaches uh, that were attempted for a while uh, with various cryptic names like Sage, Cage, and GIS, uh, which focus on the three prime or the five prime or three prime ends of transcripts or the beginning end end of transcripts in the case of GIS tags. Uh, 454 came along and this gave us you know larger numbers of reads, not not as parallel as Illumina, uh, and they're a bit longer, so they're not too bad for uh, assembling transcripts. Uh, and then Illumina came along, and it gave us a huge amount of data, but it's very fragmentary. So we have these small pieces, and we're trying to piece the transcripts back together by assembling them, uh, comparing against the reference genome. So all of these things give us a lot of data, but they require us to do a lot of inference about what the total structure of the transcript looks like, because these things are very small pieces compared to what the transcripts really are. Okay, so cufflinks. Uh, is what we're going to use to try to get at this problem. Uh, and it does a number of uh, alternative splicing tests. Uh, and I'm going to just kind of briefly describe this. It's quite uh, a lot of information. Uh, but basically, it has sort of three forms of output uh, to help us look at uh, alternative splicing patterns. So if we example, or examine a simple example uh, of a gene where we've got three transcripts that differ by their transcript start sites uh, and the exons that they include are skipped, uh, we're going to try to get the relative abundance of these isoforms by basically measuring the, the parts of the sequences that are unique to each of the isoforms. Uh, and then Cufflinks does sort of three types of tests. One is the sort of the splicing test, uh, which looks within uh, a group of transcripts that start at the same site. Uh, it tries to quantify uh, the relative uh, proportion of each of the transcripts that use that start site. So it basically takes all the transcripts out of the locus and says, these two start here, 
This one starts there, and then within that, uh, it tries to look at the difference in splicing. So in the splicing, in this example, it's basically comparing transcript A versus transcript B uh, at this start site. Uh, and then it also com directly compares the transcript start site usage, uh, so where it's basically considering these things together because they both use the same transcript start site, uh, and it's comparing those, the amount of those two things to the amount of this one thing. Uh, and then in the third mode, it considers everything with respect to uh, the actual coding portion of the, the predicted coding portion of the transcripts, uh, which is shown by these, uh, the fatter area uh, of these uh, bars. So you've got like a, a narrow part and then it becomes fat. So it's like focusing on this uh, coding part portion versus the coding portion here. So you can imagine that this actually covers a fair amount of the scenarios that I was describing uh, in these two slides, um, but not really all of the possibilities. So for example, it doesn't really tell you anything about the alternative polyadenylation sites directly, and I'm not sure why they didn't consider that. Um, so this is a bit uh, overwhelming, but the sort of take-home message is that when you finally get your, your splicing, differential splice, splicing output for each of these three tests, these are the files that we're going to uh, be looking at uh, from cufflinks for each of these three scenarios. There's a splicing.diff file, a promoters.diff file, and a cds.diff file. Uh, and that's it. So short and sweet for the lecture. Uh, Again, we'll review this flowchart to see where we're at. Uh, so we've, been, we've now gone through this entire thing. So this morning you did Cumberbund. You made it all the way to the end. What we're going to do now is back up a bit to the cufflinks step. Uh, and we're going to rerun cufflinks. So you're going to get to review the, the cufflinks command. But we're going to use different options that are uh, uh, going to allow us to run it in a way that helps learn more information about splicing. So we're going to rerun cufflinks in two additional modes. Uh, and the mode that we already ran, we're, we're going to refer to as reference only. Uh, and then by that, I mean re the reference transcript annotations. Uh, and now we're going to run it in reference guided and uh, de novo mode uh, to try to predict uh, novel isoforms. So we talked a bit about this. Um, and I just thought I would cover it because it's a common question. Uh, we, we didn't have time in this uh, tutorial to go over the scenario where you don't have a reference genome at all. Uh, but I thought I would just talk about it briefly uh, because this is a common question, uh, both online and elsewhere. What if I don't have a reference genome for my species of interest? And the first thing I usually ask people uh, when they ask me this question is, why don't you have a genome and have you considered sequencing the genome of your species? Uh, there's legitimate reasons why you might not be able to do that cost, the complexity of the genome, et cetera. But it is a really, really useful tool for studying the transcriptome to have a reference genome. Even a poor reference genome is better than none at all. Uh, and this, the cost of sequencing is low enough that fairly modest labs can start to think about taking on the task of sequencing uh, the genome of their critter of interest. Uh, so it's something to think about. But there are times where it's not practical uh, to do that. Uh, or where you just simply prefer, prefer a transcript discovery approach that does not rely on prior knowledge of the genome or the transcriptome. And there are some tools that will help you uh, in that scenario. Uh, we just don't have time to cover them. Uh, but if you look back at that, uh, that complicated list of tools that I showed a few slides ago, there's a section that summarizes some of these tools uh, for this particular scenario. Uh, and you can uh, explore some of these on your own time. Uh, I particularly recommend Trinity and Transibus. Uh, they both have fairly good reputations. Okay. Uh, 